Hi, this is Tim and Joel. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Iowa-Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Kiyosakwa, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors. Joel, we've got an exciting guest we've been trying to get on on our <laughs> docket for a while, so... Um, I'm really excited about this today, but before we uh, get into our special guest, let's talk about what we've been doing. Yeah, I think our what we've been doing is going to be real similar because it seems like we've been seeing a lot of each other, right? Well, so yeah. we've got this wood project, a table, building a table. So we've got 40 plus man hours in that together in your shop, right? So um, that's been a lot of it, and we've had two dynamic, uh, ginormous snowstorms. So it's pushing snow and woodworking. That's really, um, in Iowa, what we're doing uh, now in the first week of February. I mean, literally, I see you more than I see my wife, just about. How's that going over? Well, I mean, my <laughs> wife doesn't seem to mind, so <laughs> I don't know what that says. Healthy but. for the marriage, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, so wood projects, and we've been doing a lot of uh, podcasting. We've, got, uh, we've been doing some, uh, the Super Bowl of camera competition pretty excited about that we have not yet put out the finals yet but we're getting close to that yep yeah so, so our audience should be seeing a lot of podcasts hitting uh hitting their channel pretty soon right awesome yeah so let's get on with our special guest we have aaron palm with iowa missouri hybrids aaron thanks so much yeah for, no uh, problem glad to be here you know i call you the the food plot scientologist <laughs> careful with that <laughs> no really i mean you do a lot of great things you've really been working with your seeds and trying to get with the appropriate blends uh, i've turned a lot i think we both have turned a lot of people on that um but more we'll get more to that here in a little bit first off uh welcome yeah and thank you. Uh, thanks for having me absolutely and uh, i think the first thing we like to talk about is hey let's just talk a little bit about your business why don't you okay. Tell us about how you came to be and some of your experience. Okay. So Iowa Missouri Hybrids, I believe, has been here since I believe it was about 1939. Iowa Missouri Hybrids used to grow their own seed corn and sell it across Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. Wow. Um, I bought the business in 2008 from my aunt and uncle. They had owned it from, for a couple years prior to me buying it. Um, and we, we, I believe we started it in February of 08. Um, rough first couple of years, you know, um, I have a good ag background from years back. So there was a lot of catching up to do. And then of course we had to kind of rebuild the business to a degree, but, um, so far so good. It's the last few years have really, really picked up in intensity. Well, you know, I, your name was given to me from the place, from the previous owner of my farm. And uh, we were talking about food plots one day, and he says, hey, you need to look up this Iowa-Missouri hybrid. So everybody, everybody's starting to go to this guy. And then on top of that, so once we started to get into our podcast, you know, Kevin, Kevin Anderson says, ah. he goes, hey, you need to really talk to you, Aaron Paul. And, it, I mean, you're certainly becoming well-known. The good. word's out. Good, the word's good. Out. That's, yeah, that's yeah. good. Word of mouth is the best advertisement there will ever be. Absolutely. Period. So, I mean, for our listeners, I mean, we're here with Aaron. We we could talk about a number of subjects. We could talk fertilizers. We could talk cover crops. We could talk crops, food plots, herbicides. Herbicides. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a there's one a, subject that leads to two more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but today, I think, I mean, in order to focus on um, one topic, I think food plots. Um, as we are getting out of this tundra of uh, winter, 
I, I think it's important that people are starting to think about what am I going to do this next year yep. and start to think about a plan. So I think food plot's a good place to start. Great place to start. So, Aaron, what I'd like to do for this is is let, let's kind of think through a sequence of events. I'm, a, I'm new to hunting or I just bought my farm and I want to put in a food plot. Okay. Uh, what's, what's probably the first thing... I should be thinking about before I do So that. I guess I would treat you just like somebody that walked in and sat down in front of me and we were just shooting from the hip saying, a guy sits down, he says, hey, I want to do a food plot. I'm going to treat you like that guy right there. Okay. So a lot of different directions to go here. Um, I guess the first thing I would ask him, is, you know, what do you want to accomplish? Are you a turkey hunter? Are you a deer hunter? Are you primarily a bird hunter? And and down here being in Kiyosaka, Southeast Iowa, deer is, is usually the king. But... Trust me, when guys see turkeys or pheasants and quail coming into the plot, you know, nobody's disappointed with that either. So, Absolutely. you know, just because you're building a deer plot obviously doesn't mean you're just going to have deer in it. Or you just built something for pheasants and quail, you're just going to have pheasants and quail. I think everybody knows that. But um, I guess the first thing, what, what do we want to accomplish? I might say, okay, Tim, how big's your plot? I mean, how many acres are we dealing with here? You know, I might want to be thinking, okay, are we going to have something that's going to be a perennial or an annual? Um, are you a bow hunter? Are you hunting early? Do you hunt bow, muzzleloader, and shotgun? You know, so we want to find out what you want to accomplish. That's that's number one. By far the first thing we want to find out is, you know, what, what game you're looking to, to attract and keep on your farm. All right. That's, that's the first thing. That's awesome. And just for our listeners' perspective, about two years ago was when I met Aaron Yep. And I didn't get my crops in. So I was putting in a cover crop. And then, then on top of it, I wanted to put in food plots. So we planted 20, 25 acres that year. And uh, so for let's keep going with this thread. Uh, because you, those questions you asked were very similar to what you were asking me when I first Two talked Two years to ago, yeah. Yep. Yep. And so with that, uh, let's talk about, we're going to do deer hunting. Okay. And we're going to do deer hunting, and we're going to do bow season and shotgun. Okay. Right? For Iowa. Okay. So so for bow season, it starts October 1st, goes through October, November, right? And then no, in December, first two weeks of uh, shotgun season. I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So I'm an Iowan. That's my time frame. Now we've decided that, what's next for me? Okay, so I guess another thing I would probably think about, and it, you know, I'd want to gather all this information from you. I may not be asking these questions in the right order, but as sure. long as I've got all the information, then I can put it together. And I have guys leave here where I have an answer for them before they leave. Uh -huh. And I've got other guys, I'm like, e let me think on that just a little bit, what we might want to put together. We've got guys that have one acre food plots. That's it. They've only got one acre. They may have a very small property to hunt. They may only own a little bitty property, and that's that's all they've got. I've got other guys that, I mean, I've got one guy that's got 40-plus acres of food plots. Wow. 40-plus on several different farms. So, obviously, with him, we're going to do something quite a bit different than we are with that guy that just has one acre. So, can we pause there for sure. a second? So, on that one acre, that... that person that has one or two because that's a pretty common it is one to two acres is very common um what would you i mean for there what's the main consideration is it tonnage yeah tonnage well you know we a lot of times we'll ask them where they're from you know if i got a guy you know maybe in the fairfield area or maybe he's even further north or maybe oskaloosa or, or somewhere up in there where it's mostly ag fields he may not have a third the deer that we have down here or maybe where you're from over in albia mm -hmm. so you know you take a big deer population they can make short work of one acre just ask any farmer yeah that's right they can make very very short work of that one acre especially if it's something that they're very very attracted to or if it's close to a bedding area and it's one of the first things they come to you know maybe as they're headed out into the grain fields at night so i guess you know, we would ask things like, you know, do you know what your soil types are? Is it well drained? Is it does it, is it something that stays wet? How big is it? Is it do you want to do one species over the whole plot, or do you want to try and split it? So you kind of got to get a feel of of what they're trying back to what they're trying to accomplish. So if you're just saying, you know, if I had to, you know, if you're going to put me on the spot and say, you know, I can, I've only got room to do one acre. I, you know, and you say, hey, I'm a bow hunter, so I'm hunting, you know, maybe October first to 
middle of November primarily, yep. and you want some, I might say, Tim, you know, you come in and say, hey, I've got soil that's a little on the damp side, something that's going to handle the grazing pressure well. I have a pretty good fertility program. I'd probably say, let's plant Ladino clover because Ladino clover is going to give you a lot of bang early and it's going to keep on trucking clear into early November most years and still be pretty good. It's, it's very high protein. Um, it's relatively easy to manage. It's not super expensive to get started. And it's something that if you take care of it, it's going to be there for two to four years before you really have to do much to it. So now will Ladino clover, you and I've talked Ladino clover. Oh yeah. So will Ladino clover uh, pull deer in? Absolutely. Will, they'll seek it out? Absolutely. Yep, yep. Very, very lush, very tender. Um, like I said, high in protein. You know, so, so you know, Ladino clover, the interesting, I think guys get a lot of bang for their buck out of Ladino clover because once you get that Ladino established, I mean, it is starting to turn green in March sometimes even late February, and it is oftentimes green clear into November. Wow. So you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. The deer are on it a tremendous amount of the year. Now, is that nitrogen fixing as well? It is. It is. So, yes. Yes. so that's adding nitrogen into the soil. It is. So, and then, yeah, and we get this question a lot. You know, when guys come in and say, what do I fertilize my Ladino clover or my alfalfa with? We always tell them that that plant is actually putting nodules on the root, those little nodules it puts on the root is actually allowing it to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere. The plant needs nitrogen, but it's mm -hmm. fixing its own, and we want to encourage it to do that. Heck yeah. That's why we tell guys use a high P and K fertilizer, and we'll get into that later probably, I'm, yeah. I'm assuming. Aaron, can we just backtrack just a little sure. bit? Uh, some, someone comes in. Um, if, if I came in with a soil test, does that help you? in that first analysis or is that something you'd recommend soil steps i mean I, I i we our guys have got you know we've got a lot of guys we've been doing business with for several years now and we, i mean we even sell the soil probes we are soil tests are my thing that's the only way i have I, that's the only information you can bring me to tell me what's going on in your soil and the three the actually the four things i'm looking at probably the first thing i'm looking at in your soil test is where is that ph and for guys that, you know, a lot of guys already know this. Some guys, you know, watching this are not going to know. The pH is telling us how acidic that soil is. Sure. And really the ideal range for most things we want to be in, for, for most of the things we're going to plant here in Iowa, I like to be in, if you wanted to be that perfect range, you'd want to be a 6.5 to a 6.9. Now, not everything that we plant has to have a perfect pH to do well, but not only are our herbicides going to work better in that range, but it's going to be able to utilize more of the fertilizer you put down if the pH is in that range. So a soil test gives me a lot of information in a very short period of time. Okay. So and if watts? guys don't have it, we can we can easily walk you through how to, to go take a soil sample, and we'll even send them in. Now, we send all our tests to Midwest Labs. There are some great labs around the country. You don't necessarily have to use Midwest Labs. That's just who we've gotten on board with, sure. and they provided really good service for us. And the, the tests are really easy for me to read. And what do those run? Somebody's interested. Oh, I want to say, you know, there's always the shipping and handling. And, you know, that's gotten higher. Shipping's crept up over the past several years. But usually that's somewhere in that 20 to $22. Okay. Including the shipping and the tax. That's reasonable. And if they want to send their own in, they can do that. I mean, even like the Whitetail Institute, they've got kits you can buy, I believe. Um, there's other labs you can use. We're not promoting any one lab, but um, there's, there's several places you can send them. We just happen to be... Midwest. Yeah, with Midwest. And you mentioned pH being one of them. What, were, what are some of the other so things? So the other things I'm going to look at, um, pH is the number that is the first thing I look at. Phosphorus and potassium are the other things I look at. Another thing I'll take a quick glance at is the organic matter. And basically, in a nutshell, what the organic matter is, basically it's the, it's the amount of decomposing plant and animal matter in that soil. And generally, the blacker the dirt you have, as a rule the higher the organic matter is. Organic matter is your friend. Flat black, you know, not necessarily flat black dirt, but just dark colored soil generally has more organic matter in it, but that's also its ability to hold nutrition and its ability to hold water. And that's, that's a, critical. That's a problem with my soil. It's gray. Yes. Yeah, well, and that's I mean, typically what we call down here, clay, we call right? it white oak a lot of times. It's, it's, it's soil that is typically probably what it grows the best is white oak trees. That's probably what was on that ground 30, okay. 40 years ago, most likely. Huh. Not to say we can't grow good crops on white oak, because we do. But it's also maybe a little more management intensive. Yeah. 
I always tell if you have really, really flat, black, black dirt, you can get away with a lot more than you can on some of this marginal clay and white oak type soils. It takes, it takes a better manager to be a little more successful. Yep. Yeah, I've got, my work, I got yep. my work cut out yep. for you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're, yeah, I don't think it's organic somewhat of matter an uphill fight. <laughs> fits into my soil. Typically, we see organic matter on a lot of this soil, like in that 1.9% to, 1 .9 to like 2.5%. You get into some of your blacker soils, it's not unusual to see, you know, 2 and 3 quarter to mid threes sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's just that that you asked what we look at on the soil test, yeah, yeah. and that's just something else. There's other things on there I'll take a glance at, but P and K and pH are probably the first three, and I'll, I'll glance at that organic matter just to, it'll give me an idea. When somebody comes in, they've got really, really high organic matter. A lot of times that tells me that ground's never been farmed. So or it's it probably bare more, yeah, it may not be virgin soil. land or not far turned over Correct, for a while correct, or exactly right, yep. Okay. It could have been something that was in long-term CRP or long-term pasture, but it probably has a lot of decomposing root structure, and that's plant food. Good. Gotcha. Yep. Cool. Not yeah. something your average food plotter is, you know, really, really deep into, but it's something we can give them a quick course on. Okay. Cool. I mean, that's one of the reasons I think I'm putting, I mean, I know it is. It's one of the reasons I put, I'm putting all my ground into CRP, mm -hmm. right? It's, it needs to be fixed. It's, it's horrible shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of, you know, we hear this a lot because there's a lot of things we do other than food plots here. You know, food plots is, is just one part of our business. But, you know, there's a lot of arguments pro-CRP and a lot of arguments against CRP. And trust me, we hear it all. We hear it all. I'm not pro-CRP. That's fine. You're good. <laughs> yep. All right, so let's continue on with our sequence, sure. right? So we've determined, hey, that we're, in, we're going after... Uh, we're bow hunting and, and shotgun hunting, trying to put in a food plot. Um, we just talked about one acre. Yep. Um, but now, all right, so let's say I have a two-acre plot. Let's say that's what we're going to go with. So all I in one shot? All in two, two different one-acre plots or one two-acre plot? One two-acre plot. Okay. And let's just say, hey, that's, that's what we're going to go through for this discussion. Um, and obviously, we know that there's people on both sides of that fence. Uh, but we can't answer that all in one podcast. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So going in for a two acre, two acre. So now what's next? So if it was, you know, and I'd kind of quiz sort the guy on how it laid maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're, you know, back to, back to hunting, you say bow early, you know, we've kind of covered early October through maybe mid November. Yep. Um, other things you could look at, alfalfa would be another possibility, especially if, you know, we've already got a high pH and good fertility and the ground drains well. Um, one of the different, one of the things that we kind of use to differentiate whether we should plant alfalfa or ladino clover is how well the ground drains. Ladino clover likes to be on that ground that maybe is a little bit wetter. I don't really like to tell guys to put stuff down in the, the river bottoms or areas that just say saturated because then we suck the oxygen out of the soil and essentially the plants suffocate. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to be in it, but, but Ladino clover is very, it's not really deep rooted, but it's very fibrous rooted. There's thousands and thousands of small roots where alfalfa tends to be more of a, a big tap root. So alfalfa is more of a desert type plant. Ladino likes its moisture. But here again, there's, there's if you're gonna be bow hunting and you know, I, I would lean very strong towards Ladino clover. Um, there's other options there, but I think if you're looking at a two acre plot, I would think of splitting it. And, and we're big into diversity. Sure. As, as, as we've, you know, we followed the soil health movement with the cover crops and stuff a lot. And we've learned a lot about diversity in these food plot blends. We we'll do tend to bring in, I believe, more deer because I think their nutrition needs change throughout the year. So we're a big proponent of having different plants out there. A lot of times we'll do a mix of ladino clover, alfalfa, and say something like chicory, just to have stuff with different root structures, you know, plants that are producing different nutrition levels at different times of the year. We're big fans of diversity. That's gotten to be a big deal for us. Yeah, that makes sense. It does. It does. Plus, if something's not doing well, that you still have backup. Exactly. Right? Yep. 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 If it turns off really, really dry, your alfalfa may thrive. If it stays really, really wet and your alfalfa dies, your ladino is probably doing really well. 
And they'll so work we, together, right? I mean, they will. Well, here's another thing. Whenever we do blends, we're very careful what to throw together because, you know, let's just say we plant something and we get a really bad grass infestation and we don't want that grass in there. I don't want to throw something in there that we're going to kill when we spray to kill foxtail. So we generally want to put stuff together that's going to work together in that blend. I see a lot of food plot companies just throwing everything in a mix. Well, then stuff has different fertility requirements that limits what you can spray. Um, sometimes your seeding depth is different. So we're a big proponent of mixes and diversity, but I think a guy needs to use a lot of discretion what you throw in those mixes. Boy, sounds like a lot of things to consider. It yeah. is. So, we don't want to overcomplicate it, but by the same token, we, we want to make sure guys know what they're getting into. But let, Aaron, let's stay with the mix here a okay. second. Uh, what are... are so would you be a proponent of mixing that and everything goes everywhere or are you talking about scripts? So let's, and let's stay with the three examples that you, you tossed out, right? Okay. So are you, are, am I, should I envision, you know, a strip of Ladino, a strip of alfalfa and a strip of chicory, or is it going to be all kind of mixed together? I think you could do it. I think, you know, back to that, maybe part of, you know, that two acre plot maybe lays down in the bottom, maybe part of it's up high. I would do the chicory and the alfalfa up high where it drains good and maybe do the, the dino. If it's all the same type of ground, you could absolutely strip it. You could throw it all together. The deer are all going to find it right there. Sure. Regardless. Um, I think that's personal preference. Okay. Um, okay. It would probably be a little simpler just to throw the blend together and either drill it or broadcast it. But if you wanted to strip it, you could absolutely do that. So when you say drill, mm -hmm. like grain drill? Or? Yes, yes. I'm a, I am drill. I'm, I'm, we're big no-till fans. I've no-tilled everything for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, most of our food plot guys are going to work the dirt. But, yeah, I'm talking about a grain drill. I'm just what's, thinking what's about the how advantage small the of the no-till versus? Uh, um, like, anytime we're not working that grass, especially on these lighter soils, the more we disturb them, the more we work them, the more potential moisture we're letting out. And, you know, last year here, we did not have a significant rain from July 23rd till about the 6th of September. And some of the guys on no-till, their stuff looked a little better just because it wasn't out of moisture quite as quickly as the stuff that had been worked down to a powder. Unfortunately, most guys that come in here, whether they're out of state or local, most of your average guys don't have a $20,000 grain drill to go out there and show most, most of the ground does get worked, fertilized, harrowed smooth, seeded, sure. rolled, you know, kind of the traditional seeding methods. Hmm. But I like a drill because I, you know, especially a no-till drill, because I can do a little bit more with herbicides and I have to do a little less ground disturbance. Um, but there's a learning curve to that too. You know, you're not just going to run down to the Great Plains dealer and, and buy a $20,000 drill and drag it home and fill it full of seed and drop it in the ground. And, and you might luck out and be successful the first time, and you may go, oh, my God, what have I just done? So there's a learning curve to a drill, too. Yeah, but you don't, just because you're drilling something doesn't mean it has to be no-till. A lot of guys do a drill on work ground as well. Yeah. The thing I like about it, more even seed distribution, more even depth on your seeds. So I'm thinking about the drill I have, and I think about how small these seeds are. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking my drill wouldn't be okay for that. <laughs> I'd have to broadcast. I mean, we'd yep. have to. You do have two different pockets there, one for big grain and one for small grain. And it's something we'd certainly want to test before yes. you do it. Yeah, right? yeah. Most of your newer drills have at least two boxes on them where they can run large seed yeah, this is or a small seed. He was there there is seven new. years old. <laughs> Newish. <is> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, However. that's exactly right. <laughs> but most guys are going to do it still, you know, do it the, I, I call it the old-fashioned way, where they're still going to work the ground, fertilize it, you know, harrow it smooth, seed it, roll it. Maybe not necessarily in that order. Yeah. You know, there's not one size fits all to food plot, guys, and I think everybody knows that. There's there's not really one thing that's going to work for everybody. Okay. But there's a lot of options in this business because deer eat a lot of different stuff. Staying with the uh, the the clover mix and the alfalfa and the uh, chicory, chicory, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, like the shade, shade versus sunshine. I mean, what if what if it's in the woods versus out of the woods, or there's it's rounded by trees? What what considerations yeah, should be that, taken a, there? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a very that, good. Question. That was on your list, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. And we get that question from time to time. So this goes back to picking the species, and this goes, you know, when, when you're sitting on my side of the desk, you really can't ask too many questions. 
I think some guys look at me like, you know, why do you need to know that? What difference does that make? S different plants will tolerate different amounts of shade. Alfalfa is really designed as a full shade plant, or a, excuse me, a full sun plant. Ladino clover really can tolerate a pretty good amount of shade. I tell guys, as long as we're getting four to six hours of sunlight to those plants, we're probably okay. Hmm. You know, plants got to have sunlight for photosynthesis. You had brought up plots in the timber. Those are probably some of the most challenging ones we do. And that's for a number of reasons. Number one, they tend to get hit hardest first because they're in the timber. So a lot of times those deer are comfortable coming out at noon and working on those plots in the timber because they feel safe because they're, they're surrounded by trees sure. or brush. Um, versus, you know, if it's out on the timber edge next to a gravel road, they may be a little more leery about coming out at noon. So those those plots typically get hit hard. On the flip side, they can be some of the best plots to kill a, a good buck early, earlier in the day, because they're coming out sooner. However, a lot of times because it's been timber, a lot of times we have very acidic soil. Usually we have no fertility to speak of in those and we're competing, the, usually the surrounding trees are shading it very, very badly. Especially if you've got trees on all four sides, because then you're getting sun blocked all day long. Like I said, as long as we're getting four to six hours of at least some filtered sunlight into those plots, you should be okay with most items that we would sell for a food plot mix. Hmm. But most guys, sometimes we have to trim some trees back. You know, a lot of guys are bringing dozers in. You may want to... You may want to clear it back a little bit further because, we, like I said, without sunlight, we do not have plant growth. So it sounds like you're going to be investing in electric <laughs> fence just like I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I won't distract the podcast at this yep. time, but I've got some follow-up questions. Those, <laughs> those plots, though, in the timber can be really yeah. good. I mean, yeah. those timber plots can be really, really good. But yeah. personally, I think they're a little more challenging to manage. Okay. Okay. But if you we'll, got the we'll capability, come back to that. We'll circle come back, back to, to that because I've got some sure. personal interest in that. Okay. So. All right. So we we've decided we're going to go with our three mix. Okay. Right. We're going to go with uh, Ladino, and we're going to do the Alpha Alpha and some chicory. Chicory. Right. So I've decided we've we've had this discussion. We've decided what we're going to go with. Now what do I do? Okay. Is this something Tim that's been a plot before, or is this a brand new? Never been a food plot before. Uh, let's just say it's never been a food plot before because I think we'll cover more of those okay. things that we need to do okay. Uh, okay. than if it's been a food plot before. So back to the one acre scenario. Yep. So first thing I'm going to do on, on everything is soil sample it. Okay. Um, timing. Um, you know, you're probably on something like that. You're probably looking at, probably looking at somewhere around mid-April. Okay. To get that started. So, I mean, if you knew you were going to do that plot, say, you knew you were going to do this plot in the fall, mm -hmm. you could potentially get a lot of your prep work done in the fall. You do, you could get your soil test done in the fall. Maybe you could get your your seed, your uh, your groundwork done. Like if you were going to disc it or field cultivate it or chisel it or whatever, you could get that work done in the fall and you'd be that much further ahead in the spring. But, yeah, and you could also get your fertility down in the fall if you wanted to. Because fertilizer, guys, got to remember, fertilizer has to break down before plants can take it up. So now there's a little bit of an exception there with like nitrogen urea. It's available very, very quickly, especially if there's moisture in the soil. But P and K takes some time to break down. So we like putting on P and K in the fall. And that's a mix that's going to use a fair amount of P and K. So can I use, this is on a personal note, uh, so... Uh, full disclosure, this last fall I didn't put down any fertilizer. Okay. Right? Plus I haven't done any soil samples. But okay. Let's just assume I did my soil samples. I'm now coming into spring. Would you advise then to put in the the prescribed amount of fertilizer in it yes. in spring, even I though I might not plant to the fall? Yeah. Um, that mix could be done spring or fall. Uh-huh. Um, I really don't have a preference either way. Can I plant them together? You could. Can I do the fertilizer and the seeds? You sure can. Too? You sure can. Mm -hmm. Not a problem with that at all. Yep. That's a mix you're going to plant very shallow. The mm -hmm. seeds aren't very big. Yep. 
you know, we'll do the ratio on, on how much of each, you know, ratios are important too. Otherwise you could find yourself with a whole lot of the dino clover and very little alfalfa and chicory. So seed size, cause that's kind of more on our end of it. Once you decide sure. that's the mix we're going to use. Okay. Mm -hmm. but yeah. We, we like guys to get some of that prep work done in the fall on a brand new plot because we never know what spring's going to bring. Sure. You know, we've seen guys not, I mean, remember here, what, what a year ago, guys couldn't get their corn planted until the first week of June. It just never stopped raining. Yep. Yeah. So the you know you may have some we've we've seen some very narrow planting windows, you know. And if you had to do your soil sample, you had to do all your breaking of the ground, and you know coming in the spring and, and working it smooth and level, you know you may not have enough time to do that. Where had you done some of that in the fall, now you've got enough time in the spring we can get that done, even if we do have a narrow planting window. So being prepared is no different in my business than it is, you know, from a farmer. Okay. The more prepared you are, the better plan. And another thing I tell guys in this business is it's not a bad idea to have a plan B because plan A doesn't always work out. We had that last year. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. So it's, let's just say let's just say you you could not get that stuff in in the spring and you you just had it set in your mind you wanted to put that in in the spring, well maybe we'd go to a brassica plot or something there in the fall. That would still allow you, because a brassica plot's not going to be perennial, so all those plants are going to be gone next spring, and you could come back and do it again in the spring. Okay. Mm -hmm. Try again next year. Yes. Have yeah. a plan B. All right. And so, we'll help with that as well. So I've done the soil sample. Mm -hmm. Now what do I do? So if you're doing this in the fall? Yeah. So there again, if, you know, I always ask guys, another one of those questions I ask is, is this ground going on, this food plot, is it going to go on highly erodible ground? Is it going on relatively flat ground with just a little slope to it? We tell guys two places I will never put a food plot. Number one, where it can be seen directly from the road because you're just inviting poacher activity. Sure. And I generally, if at all possible, I will not put a food plot on highly erodible ground. You're just asking for new ditches and erosion gullies to start. If guys are going to put it on more erodible ground, that's where I'd really encourage guys to do as much of that no-till or minimum till as possible and maybe lean towards a plot that's more of a perennial that's going to be there three, four, maybe even five years before you have to tear it up and replant it. The more we open that ground up on, on erodible ground, the more susceptible, because you know how these patterns have been down here? You know, you get four inches of rain in two days and then maybe you get a couple days break and get another inch of rain and then maybe three or four days later we get another inch of rain. And then it doesn't rain for 60, <laughs> 60 days. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. It's a dry, yeah. dry fall, late yep. summer. Put as many things, I, I tell this to a lot of our farmers too, no different than put as many things in your favor as possible because Mother Nature all by herself can destroy our plants. So okay. let's put as much of that in our favor as we can. All right, so we've we've gone and we've, we've now uh, done the soil sample. Right, and our ground is sloping. Okay. Sloping, not highly erodible. Okay. So I think I'm hitting the middle yep. of the road there yep, for you are. most people. Very common. Yep. Uh, so then what? Is it fertilized? Do I put fertilizer on there? Yeah, next? I think I'd get the fertilizer in there. Yeah, and I'd like to see you work that fertilizer in. There again, if that, if that fertilizer is mixed in with the soil, it's going to break down faster if it's just thrown on top. So how do you want me to mix that in? So the fertilizer, so a lot goes back to what you've got for equipment. You know, we've got a lot of guys with, you know, big garden tractors or little compact, you know, 40, 50 horse, you know, I call them compact or, ut you know, utility tractors. And they make a lot of implements for these small machines now. Sure. They really do. A lot of guys still have the tillers. You know, everything's got its plus and minus, but anything you can do to stir that fertilizer with the dirt is going to help it break down faster. Moisture is a big factor there because mm -hmm. moisture will help break that fertilizer down. You can mix it with all the dirt you want if it's powder dry, but it's still not going to break down until there's some moisture added to it. So drag, would I drag it? Is that, is that enough? The tiller would work good because, you know, the tiller stirs, mm -hmm. stirs it together. A field cultivator, a disc, any of those things will get that fertilizer mixed with that dirt so it can start breaking down. Like I said, until that fertilizer breaks down, it's not available to the plant. So Aaron, staying with that, just using me as an example, I'm, I've got a tiller this year, but okay. past years I'm going to disc. Yep. And then I might, I might drag it to, you know, even it out a little bit. Yes. And then either yes. plant or, what, so you're saying disc it, 
okay to drag it, kind of level it out, smooth it out, put your fertilizer, put your fertilizer down, and then redisc it. You could, you could, if okay. it needs to be redisc. You know, sometimes when you work ground. It all depends on the you know the, the type of ground it is. Yeah. Sometimes it comes up cloddy, clumpy. clumpy. Yeah. So we tell guys on new plots, a lot of times we'll tell them, go ahead and work it one time. Put your fertilizer on because it's easier to see your tracks from your ATV or your pull-behind fertilizer cart or whatever you happen yeah. to got. Some guys even have the co-ops come in you know, with their big buggies and, and throw it on you know, that way. And then work it again. Okay. You know, some guys will work it. You know, If you've got a big rectangle plot, maybe the first time you work it, you put just a little bit of angle on it. Put your fertilizer down, and then work it again the direction you're going to plant it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, this year yeah. I'm going to have a power tiller, right? A, a PTO-driven yep. tiller. It's very so common gonna, in the food plot I'm business. I'm till it. Um, I, I shouldn't have to drag it because those things do an awesome job. They do. Fertilize it and come back and till it again? Yeah, a lot of guys will come back. You know, with, with some of these, the old rule of thumb is the smaller the seed, and this doesn't matter whether you're a food plot guy, whether you're seeding your lawn, or whether you're a farmer. The smaller the seed, the generally the closer to the surface it's yeah. going to be. Like a Ladino uh, alfalfa chicory mix. And we're just using that for example. There's other options guys could do. But I wouldn't want any of those seeds really any deeper than a quarter of an inch. Yeah. So a tiller is going to be working that ground down several inches deep. Yeah. And it makes it very fluffy. So what I would like to do with something like that is either, you know, till your fertilizer in. And then you could run a drag harrow over it. Or if you're comfortable with it being smooth and flat, you're probably going to want some type of cultipacker. Mm -hmm. We need to firm that ground up. Now, if Mother Nature cooperates, a lot of guys, I've seen guys go out there and just broadcast the seed and you get a nice quarter, half inch of rain and it Perfect. comes up beautiful. And I've seen guys tear that ground up and you get a gully washer comes through with three or four inches of rain and it just <laughs> packs it. And some of that seed will be, if you know, if you throw that little bitty teeny tiny seed on top of that ground that's been worked up five, six inches, a lot of times that, that hard driving rain will push that seeds in further and then cover them up with a little more mud. And then the seeds are in too deep. And then pretty soon we have 50% germination. Yeah. Yeah. So right. I just tell guys if they, they, you want to be able to walk across those plots on a lot of this stuff, you want to be able to see your footprints, but you don't want to sink in three inches. Sure. But like I said, if the, if the weather cooperates... Sometimes you can throw it on. I've seen guys get away with murder stuff they never should have been able to get away with. And I've seen guys do it textbook perfect and still Mother Nature comes along and, and takes it away from you. I mean, right. that's the common theme we're hearing from multiple people. Is, yes. Uh, and some most of these seeds is, is shallow is the way to go. Yep. Got it. All depends on what we're seeding. Like if I was doing corn, I would want my corn in at an inch and a half to two inches deep. We tell our farmers two inches. Soybeans, I like to see them a good solid inch in the ground. The dino, alfalfa, uh, purple top turnips, the brassicas, quarter of an inch is about enough. Aaron, we just finished, uh, we just laid down our, our fertilizer. Um, but I want to take a step back if we could. Where do I go to get fertilizer? Okay. Uh, you know, I'm going to let you answer and I'm just tell you what we've kind of learned as well. Go ahead. So, so fertilizer, you know, when we, we, when we send that soil test in, we, have, we can get it with fertilizer recommendations or we can get it without fertilizer recommendations. Our experience for the two to three dollars, we might as well go ahead and get the fertility requirement or the fer fertility recommendations from Midwest Labs or whatever lab you're using. Sure. And that'll give us a pretty good idea of what we should put down according to the soil test. So, you know, the guys that have the big acres are generally going to go to the co ops. Like your nutrient ag or your, you know, whatever co-op you happen to have in your, when I say I co-op, I, th I think most people are going to know what I'm talking about. The yeah, same co-op that the farmers are going to use. Usually if you need fertilizer in quantity, I'm not trying to cut my own throat because we sell a lot of bag fertilizer and we also sell poultry litter now in bags, which is a very, very, very good fertility source. Most guys are going to go get it from the co-ops in 50 pound bags. The hardware store, you know, like Orsland's Tractor Supply, Menards, those are all options for you. Anybody that carries bag fertilizer will do what you need it to do. Um, where you got to watch it, a lot of your places will sell 30-pound bags or 40-pound bags or 50-pound bags. So, you know, it kind of goes back to price per pound instead of how much does the bag cost. You're always going to be better off dollar-wise to buy it in bulk. 
because you're not paying for the bags and you're not paying for somebody to bag it, stack it on a pallet, shrink wrap it, and ship it. It's just generally going to be cheaper if you can buy it in bulk. However, we usually tell guys if you don't have at least at least five acres, you're probably better off to do it in bags. So that's what we've been doing is we've been kind of, rightly or wrongly, uh, we f- we figure out what kind of food plots we're putting in, mm-hmm. and then what we do is we share the costs, and then we buy it in bulk. Yes. And we'll take in, you know, four, three, four, five garbage cans and fill them up. Yes. Now, where you may run into, let's just say, Tim, that you had three acres of corn that requires <coughs> a lot of nitrogen, and over here you have three acres of beans that, we don't put any nitrogen on. Well, when you want to go to the co-op, and it's a little tougher to come up with a one mix for sure. everything. You really should think about doing two different blends on something like that. Yep. Plot, so, plot seed yes. specific. Yeah. yeah. So see, we'll carry like, like for us, just for example, we carry a lot of 18, 18, 18, mm-hmm. which is a general fertilizer. It's got the same amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it in equal amounts. We sell a lot of 628, 28, for like soybean plots, the dino clover, alfalfa, that don't need the nitrogen. But then like somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm doing a sorghum plot or I'm doing a, a corn plot. We may sell them 62828 to get the P and the K, but then bag urea to get the nitrogen component. Sure. Where you don't want to put the nitrogen on the beans because it's a legume, just mm-hmm. like the ladino. It will get its nitrogen from the atmosphere. Yeah, so reiterating what you just said, uh... We do it food plot species specific. Specific. Good idea. Yeah. Like brassicas or yes. Uh, yes. rye or yeah. whatever. You could do brassicas two ways. As a matter of fact, when you buy brassicas from us and you don't have a soil test, we'll give you a general fertilizer recommendation. I'm not telling everybody you got to go out and pull soil samples, but I think it's a great idea because it can answer a lot of questions for very little dollars. So before we move forward, let's talk soil samples. It just I know we've talked it at length no, already. It's very important. Uh, do I need to do a soil sample every year or could I do it every other year? It would be a decent practice. So what I tell guys, if, if it's a plot that's, if you've been a guy that's been really good about fertility and maybe Pell Lime, we saw a lot of Pell Lime as well to help adjust these pHs. If you've been very vigilant about it and, we've, and, and you bring in a soil test and I say, you know, this doesn't look too bad. It looks pretty good. I mean, we could maybe make a tweak here and there, but it looks good. I would say you could probably fertilize about every, or excuse me, you could probably soil test about every third year oh, or right. maybe even every fourth year. But I think if you've got a bare piece of ground and you bring in that soil sample and it's like, oh my God, Tim, this is terrible. It needs a lot of attention. We may want to soil sample that every year or every other year until we get it up where it looks pretty good. And then we can kind of go off what you've been planning there as to what we need to put back on it to replenish it. I'm Does that due. make sense? Yeah, I'm due. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, right out of the bat on mm-hmm. new soil on new food plots, I like to see a soil sample. We can overdo it too. I'm not telling guys you need to soil sample every year. Mm-hmm. I do, but some I do a lot of trial stuff. So. And I, you know, I've been doing soil samples enough. I got a pretty good idea of what I'm reading. Um, but I would say if you want to split the difference, let's pull them every other year. Sure. Okay. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be be safe, safe, have have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors.